This module looks at post-war liberation and its effects on fashion during the 40s and 50s. This was the age of streamlining, consumerism and style, 1935 to 1955. The main designers during this time were Christian Dior, famous for the new look, Cristobal Balenciaga, Pierre Cardin for the trapeze and the trapeze look. This period also witnessed art movements called Abstract Expressionism, the Age of Affluence, Internationalism, the Civil Rights Movement, Evolution of the Mass Culture and the Popularity of Man-Made Fabrics. Consumerism and Style By the mid-30s, the professional designer influenced many new products that affected the way majority of urbanized people lived and worked. The rich no longer were the only ones who could afford carefully considered objects. Increasingly, style-conscious goods began to penetrate the mass market. Increase in wealth of social groups encouraged manufacturers to increase their output and to find new technological means of achieving this end. One major opportunity was the exploitation of new materials, in particular new metals, their alloys and plastics. The automobile was one of the mass manufactured goods that was reaching a large audience. Since the demise of Ford's famous dictum, it doesn't matter what color a car is as long as it is black, styling had become the norm in the American automobile industry. Stylists were employed by big American corporations to create the dream machines. The people's car, a triumph of function over styling where appearance was concerned, was also a product of this period. The little European cars quickly became familiar appendages of the mass environment in continental Europe. Two cultures emerged in people's homes, the futuristic, pro-technology style of the kitchen and living room that was steeped in traditional values and ideas about comfort. The office was revolutionized by appearance of streamlined typewriters, adding machines, cash registers and pencil sharpeners, combined with the new approach towards org office organization. Greater efficiency was encouraged through the use of more and more machines and increasingly intensive time and motion studies. Streamliners wanted a seamless integrated whole with moving parts covered that presented an efficient sleek outline. Streamlining was originally functional, essential for development in mass transportation like cars, planes, boats and trains. International competition spurred innovation and daring deeds of aeronautics and driving. Torpedo forms of airships, seaplanes and monoplanes became popular images of technological achievement. The early post-war years were characterized by a call for style in the countries affected by war. Huge efforts were made to move beyond the limitation of the traditional industrial arts into industrial design proper. While exclusive, handmade goods of ceramic and glass entered the lives of few people, mass-produced oven to table wear aimed at the mass market changed the lives of vast sectors of society. High technology entered everyday life, eliminating the burden of almost every manual task imaginable as well as increasing leisure options. Design became linked with mass production and mass consumption and style became the means through which the vast majority defined its social aspirations and preferred way of life. Design exhibitions attracted huge audiences and enthusiasm. It was New York's World Fair 1939 that showed the mass potential of style for the first time. It promoted the American streamlining through architecture and futuristic products. The largest exhibitions were automobile companies, General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, etc. After the war, the large-scale world exhibitions were not revived and their roles as disseminators of style were taken on instead by other smaller, specifically design-oriented shows such as the Milan Triennials. The age of the atom exploded upon mass consciousness and the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945 and continued to ripple through the design world throughout the 1950s. 
the molecular model consisting of primary colored electron spheres on wires orbiting a nucleus provided a familiar motif for furniture, light fittings, coat racks, souvenirs and objects de art. Other byproducts of scientific inquiry included fabric and service designs based on crystal and molecular structures as observed under the microscope, producing liberated random patterns free from associations with earlier designs. Streamlining is derived originally from aerodynamic experiments such as wind tunnel testing for objects of transport. However, it had a number of other sources including futurist paintings, airships, tapered forms of dolphins and porpoises, and the abstract engineered forms of objects like grain silos, bridges and factory machines. To these were added the futuristic shapes and speed whiskers called used by comic book artists. These influences all combined to form a particularly American aesthetic characterized by bulbous teardrop body shells for mechanical and electrical products and expressive organic forms for decorative art objects. This aesthetic was applied to a vast range of artifacts from locomotives to irons regardless of their potential for high speed movement or lack of it. The important international developments during this period were the end of World War II, Cold War, end of European imperialism, McCarthyism, the silent generation, the beginnings of social protest, the beatniks, the civil rights movement. The beatniks began as a literary movement that included writer Jan Kerouac and poets Allen Ginsberg and Gregory Corso. The beats adopted eccentric habits of dress and grooming beards, ponytails, dirty sneakers and peasant blouses. They experimented with drugs, turned to Eastern mysticism, especially Zen, Buddhism and rejected the square world. Contacts with French existentialists led to the adoption of black clothes, especially turtlenecks and berets for men and leotards, tights and ballet slippers for women. Other major influences on fashion were the silent generation moving to the suburbs. Fashion influences from the young such as the teddy boys, the impact of television, internationalism, the fabric revolution, the changing couture led by prominent designers of post-war couture, the American mass market, American retailers and the couture, and new centers of fashion design. Post-World War II, women returned to housemaking, create, creating a baby boom. Women's magazines emphasized family and togetherness. Highway systems expanded, suburbs grew, families traveled, recreation increased, and domestic help was scarce. This led to more informal styles in clothing, use of sportswear increased, and there were other lifestyle changes. Shopping became a recreational activity, and the mall became a social place. The post-war social economic changes kept many young people dependent on their families for a longer period of time. This accentuated the period of adolescent as a separate stage of development. The teen market grew. In Britain, during the late 40s and 50s, the Teddy Boys created a first truly independent fashion for young people. Teddy Boys were working class British adolescents who adopted styles in menswear that had an Edwardian flavour. Longer jackets with more shaping, high turned back lapels, cuff sleeves, waistcoats and well cut narrow trousers. They adopted an exaggerated version of these styles such as elongated loose jackets, wide padded shoulders and often a velvet collar. Trousers were very narrow, tight and short enough to allow garishly coloured socks to show. They added narrow neckties, winkle pickers with shoes with exaggeratedly pointed toes. Their hair was somewhat longer with sideburns and ducktail shape cut at the back known as DA. Females wore long grey jackets over tight high necked black sweaters and black skirts with dark stockings a feminized version of winkle pickers with high heels. Television also had a tremendous impact on fashion. 
TV became commercially available to the American public by 1948. It had a direct impact on spreading fashion. Some styles that became popular were white bucks, shoes of white, buckskin worn by Pat Boone and Elvis Presley. It had a direct impact on spreading fashion. Some styles that became popular were white bucks, shoes of white buckskin worn by Pat Boone and Elvis Presley's pompadour. Further, a slick combed back hairstyle and a fad for Davy Crockett coonskin caps became popular. More attention was paid to maternity clothing and Lucille Ball allowed the story of I Love Lucy to incorporate her pregnancy into a TV show. Women, however, wanting to emulate TV fashion, concentrated on ball gowns and cocktail dresses worn by singers and actresses. Air travel encouraged traveling abroad and fashion exchange encouraged receptivity to imported goods. Imported fashion goods from Western European countries were high-end luxury products and commanded high prices. Imports from third world countries of Asia, Africa and South America cost much less than European goods and dominated the low-end and mid-range markets. High fashion design took on a more international flavor. This period also saw a revolution in fabrics. New fiber, fibers such as nylon, modacrylic, polyesters, triacetates and spandex entered the consumer market. Easy to care fabrics, fewer domestic help and travelling encouraged the acceptance of drip dry clothing. The use of wash and wear and permanent press fabrics began. These new fibers may have contributed to the popularity of full skirts of the period which were held out by lightweight permanently stiffened nylon petticoats. Ready-made clothing now came with wash care labels. French couturiers were part of the organization Chambre Syndicale, a business organization that serves to promote the products of designers. Members are required to develop and show new styles several times each year. Most French couture houses did not make profits on their haute couture operations. They established auxiliary enterprises such as perfumes and accessories which had lower overheads and therefore became profitable. New Look was the name given by the fashion press to the collection showcased by Christian Dior. Cristobal Balenciaga was a favorite of Carmel Snow, the editor of Harper's Bazaar, and often featured his work in the magazine. Coco Chanel did not reopen her atelier until 1954 and once again became a major force in couture. Other designers were Pierre Balmain, Pierre Cardin, Jacques Fath, Faith and Hubert de Givenchy. During World War II, America emerged as a fashion design center and continued so after the war. The knockoff industry also flourished with increased travel. By the 1950s, Florence, London and Rome had joined Paris and New York as important centers of fashion. Costume for women. Two new trends emerged, the new look and the gradual emergence of a softer, easier style. Skirt lengths dropped sharply. The square padded shoulder since the 30s was replaced by a softer, rounded shoulder achieved by shaped shoulder padding. Many designs had enormously full skirts. Slim pencil skirts were also worn. Waists were nipped in and small. The rounded curves of the body were emphasized, especially in jackets with basques, which were padded and stiffened into a full round curve. To achieve the fashionable look, women returned to more confining underclothing. However, with the new synthetic fabrics, the desired shape was achieved without the rigid and painful boning and lacing of the previous century. Underwear included brassieres or bras emphasizing an uplift. They also came in strapless versions for strapless evening gowns. Many women wore waist cinches to narrow the waist. Corsets or corset-like garments were now called girdles or foundation garments. To hold out the skirts and dresses, full petticoats were required. Crinoline-like slips were worn under the skirts. Day dresses sported necklines that were plain, round or square. They either ended close to the neck or lower. Many dresses had small, square or round Peter Pan style collars, large round or square collars or Mandarin style standing collars. Sleeves were mostly close fitting, most popular style being a short cap sleeve.
satin sleeves were used in various lengths. They fit closely to the arms as well as the shirt sleeves similar to those on men's shirts but fuller. Dress styles included summer jack jacket dresses, usually sleeveless and with small straps or halter tops and a short jacket or bolero over it. Other costumes included shirt waist dresses and coat dresses with full skirts. Narrow skirts were worn with jackets that fit closely to the waistline, extending below the waist, where they either flared out into stiffened peplum or had a rounded, stiffened and padded hip. Most maternity dresses were two-piece with loosely fitting tops over narrow skirts that had a stretch panel or open area to accommodate the expanding figure. Evening dresses were the same length as day dresses and were called ballerina length. They were especially popular with high school and college students and were worn over stiff crinolines. Bridal gowns were generally floor length. Wide skirts were preferred for evenings but some narrow skirted styles had elaborate puffs or fabrics at the hips of fishtails. Strapless bodices predominated and were often boned. For the outdoors, coats either followed the silhouette having fitted bodice areas and full skirts or were cut full from the shoulders. Most fitted coats were cut in princess line and belted. Full coats had a good deal of flair in the skirt. Sleeve styles included kimono and raglan types. Some had turn back cuffs ending well above the wrist and long gloves were worn with these. Fur, co fur coats were popular with affluent women. Jackets ending above the waist were called shorties or toppers. They were a convenient way of accommodating these wide skirts. For sports, casual garments were worn during leisure time and in informal situations. This became a large part of the wardrobe. Skirts were either full or narrow. Lines of blouses were shaped to follow body contours with darts or seams so that they fit smoothly through the ribcage and the bust. Sweaters worn either tucked into the skirt or outside with the belt fit close to the body. Many sweaters had smooth shoulder lines achieved by knitting sleeve and body in one. Variations included matching cardigans and pullover. Evening sweaters with beaded or sequin decoration and bolero-like cardigans called shrugs. Shorts were upper thigh length and fairly straight. Bermuda shorts were also adopted. Narrow pants fit the legs so closely that shoes had to be taken off in order to put the pants on. Pant lengths included those that ended at the ankle. Houseboy pants ending at the calf and shorter mid-calf length pants were called pedal pushers. Loose printed or knit tops were worn commonly with pants. A scanty two-piece bikini was introduced by designer Jacques Heim, inspired from the Atabom explosion in Bikini Islands. It was later called a bikini. Most American women, however, were more conservative ba bathing suits for the first half of the decade. Bathing suits were cut with button-like shorts, while others had shirt-like constructions, and a few had bloomers. Cotton, nylon and elastex were popular fabrics. Shorts, trousers or skirts and sweaters were worn on golf courses. Cotton golfing dresses were constructed with extra pleating of fabric at the shoulders to accommodate the golf swing. Ski pants narrowed and were worn with closely woven windbreaker jackets in bright colors. Tennis clubs required players to wear white. However, players in public courts wore ordinary sportswear. Nightwear followed the trend towards full skirts and figure-hugging bodices. Tailored pajamas were also available. Short hair had become fashionable with the new look. In the mid-50s, longer hair was again in fashion. Hats were worn only on very formal or religious occasions. Hats ranged from small in scale to large-brimmed picture hats. In the late 1950s, hats were consistently small and fit the head closely. Turban styles in brightly coloured prints or plain colours were also seen. Stockings and hosiery were generic terms and included items ranging from long sheer stockings also called hose to ankle length cotton stockings also called socks or anklets. Women called their long sheer stockings nylons as they were mostly made of nylon. Seam stockings were popular. Seams were usually stitched in dark thread with reinforced heels made in yarn dark yarn and extended several inches up 
the back of the ankles. Through 1940s and mid 1950s, rounded toes and very high heels and some open toed ankle strap sling back or sandal styles were worn for dress. Lower heels and flat shoes were also available. Casual styles like moccasins, loafers, ballet slippers and canvas tennis shoes called sneakers became popular. Gloves were worn for many occasions. They were available in cotton and nylon knits in a variety of weights, textures and colors as well as leather. They ranged from very short for day dresses to elbow length for strapless evening gowns. Handbags tended to be moderate in size, usually with small handles. Close fitting necklaces, bracelets and earrings were favored. Rhinestones, colored stones and imitation pearls in a variety of colors were used for costume jewelry. Women favored bright red lipstick and used face makeup in natural skin tones. Mascara or eyelashes and pencils on eyebrows were used. After 1956, eye makeup became more pronounced with the introduction of colored eyeshadow. Nail polish was available in many shades of pink and red. By the late 1950s and early 1960s, a new silhouette had emerged, the unfitted look. Designers Dior and Balenciaga were the prominent designers at the time who initiated this change. For men, boxer shorts, jockey type shorts, athletic shirts and t-shirts remained much the same. But the variety of fabrics and colors in which these items were manufactured increased. Esquire, a men's magazine with a heavy emphasis on fashion, introduced the term the bold look for men in October 1948. This was not a radical change but a continuation of the English drape cut with greater emphasis on a coordination between shirt and accessories and the suit. Broad shouldered jackets had lapels with a long roll. Double breasted suits predominated. Jackets were somewhat longer than during wartime years. After wartime restrictions were lifted, most pant legs were cuffed. Shirts tended to have white collars. The teddy boy influences moved into mainstream menswear. Suits with less padding in the shoulders and a narrower silhouette with, and single breasted styles prevailed. Dark grey, also called charcoal, was the most popular shade for menswear suit for the career-minded businessmen. It was the shirts worn with grey flannel suits that provided touches of colour, sometimes pink or light blue. Shirts most often had small collars, either in the button-down style or they were fastened together under the tie with a pin. As polyester fibres came into widespread use, they were blended with cotton to make wash and wear shirts that wrinkled less than all cotton shirts. Vests were also produced in bright colours for informal occasions. Continental suits were popular in the 1950s and continued in the 1960s. These suits had shorter jackets, a closer fit through the torso and rounded cutaway jacket fronts. Evening wear consisted of tuxedos or dinner jackets. The cut of the jacket followed the prevailing cut of jackets of daytime. White dinner jackets were worn in the summer. In the 1950s, designs for outdoor garments featured trimmer coats with narrower lines. Some specific styles included tan polo coats, tweed, checked and small pattern fabric coats and raglan sleeved coats. In the late 1950s, wraparound belted coats were revived. Coats for casual wear were generally either hip or waist length, made in sturdy fabrics, lined or unlined, had satin or raglan sleeves and either buttoned or zippered clothing, closings. Clothing favoured by college students influenced some of the sportswear styles. Fashion promoters called this the Ivy League look. Sports jacket reflected the cut of business suits. During the grey flannel suit era, sports jackets of tartan plaid were popular. In the mid-50s, sports jackets were cut along the lines seen in continental suits and had interesting textures achieved by using raised cord or slub yarns with thick and thin areas. Leather buttoned corduroy jackets in checked and plaid and Indian madras plaids were also fashionable. The long rolled up sleeves showed off the biceps, a very popular style shown, shown by Rock Hudson. For casual occasions, the young crowd liked the loafer or a slip-on leather shoe. 
for leisure wear, sweater, polo shirt and wool flannel pants worn by Robert Wagner. This fashion combination is popular with the young stars. In the 1950s, casual trousers were slim and straight. Among the important Ivy League styles were chinos, khaki coloured twill weave cotton fabric trousers with a small belt and buckle at the back. These were generally worn with button-down shirts or crew neck sweaters. In the late 1950s, self belts and beltless trousers were worn. Slacks tapered to the ankles and were cuffless. Bermuda or walking shorts were revived for general sportswear. These were combined with knee-length stockings. In the immediate post-war period, sports shirts reflected the wide-collared stylings of more formal shirts. They were made in bright colours. Plaids were especially popular. In the 1950s, small patterned fabrics in shirts with button-down collars were preferred. Knitted shirts and sweaters of all kinds were worn, including t-shirts and polo shirts. In the early 1950s, tailored trunks were preferred for swimming, especially medium-length boxer shorts. Men sometimes wore sets of matching sports shirts and trunks. By the end of the 50s, varieties of trunks similar to Bermuda shorts, still longer Jamaica shorts and tailored trunks were all being worn. For sleepwear, men preferred pajamas to night shirts. After World War II, some men continued to wear short crew cuts like those given to soldiers. When the hair was cut flat on top, it was called a flat top. In the 1950s, a contrasting style inspired by Teddy Boys and Elvis Presley in the US had curly pompadour in front and hair at the back brushed into a DA. Older men tended to compromise somewhere in between with hair long enough to be combed back from the forehead. Fedora was the staple of men's headwear. President Dwight Eisenhower helped re-establish the homework for formal occasions. Straw hats for summer followed the lines of the fedora and hat brims decreased in size. Businessmen in winter wore a narrow Russian style hat made of astrakhan fur or its imitation in synthetic fiber. Sporty hats like the Tyrolean hat with a sharply creased crown, a narrow brim turned up in the back and down in the front was worn. Sports car, car drivers wore flat crown caps with visors. Some men wore flat crowned, small brimmed, round pork pie hats. Synthetic fibers made possible one size stretch stockings. These were available in a variety of patterns and styles. Anti static finishes were added to avoid clinging. By varying the type of leather used, the color and style detailing. The same type of shoes could be used by manufacturers to make shoes for either dress or casual wear. Popular styles were Oxfords, Brogues and Mocassin. White buxin shoes and Italian shoes were also fashionable. Functional items like wristwatches, handkerchiefs, umbrellas and jewellery such as ring, identification bracelets, cufflinks and tie pins were used. For children, long pants up to about size 3 were made with gripper snap fasteners up the inseam and around the crotch to facilitate changing of diapers without having to take off the entire garment. For children at the crawling age, knees were reinforced. Small girls were dressed in loose yoked dresses. Boys wore romper suits or short pants. Both boys and girls wore long corduroy pants or overalls. Girls followed smaller versions of their adult counterparts in costume. Princess line, full skirts and jumpers were popular. Styles of blouses and tops were tailored shirts, which often had rounded Peter Pan collars, knit polo shirts, t-shirts and other knit tops. Girls tended to keep their hair short. Dressing boys in jacket and knickers was ad abandoned. Suits with long pants in adult styles were available for boys. Younger boys wore Eton jackets and blazers were worn by all age groups. Casual shirt styles included knitted t-shirts that pulled over the head and polos with collars and buttoned vents at the top. Woven sports shirts and plaid flannel shirts in winter. Usually the hair was cropped short or in a crew cut. In the 1940s, girls wore long full black skirts 
with leg of mutton sleeves, plate blouses and flat ballet slippers and denim jeans with saddle shoes and a large shirt with a loose tail. In the 50s, fluffy bedroom slippers were a fad. Poodle skirts, full circle felt skirts with a poodle applique in contrasting colour or felt. Rhinestones were used for the eyes and to form a collar on the dog. Such skirts were worn together with ankle socks, two-tone saddle shoes, a white shirt and a small scarf tied around the neck.